Hey, everyone. Welcome to the Story Making Show. I am excited to be with Harris. Harris is a speaker, a professional illusionist, a creative entrepreneur, and the author of the book, The Wonder Switch. Thanks for being with me, Harris. And excited to be with you. Thanks for the invitation. Absolutely. When I get a chance to talk with someone like you, I'm like, okay, I want to talk stories and this will be good. So I can't say no to that. <laughs> For anyone who doesn't know you, can you just give a little brief overview of like your story? How did you become an illusionist? Like just a little recap mm -hmm. of how how you got into that and even how it applies to like wonder, because wonder is one of those topics you light up like a Christmas tree. So I want to keep you on wonder. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, those who know me well, brief is the hard part of that question. Um, I'll try to keep it brief. It really started when I was nine years old. I grew up in a small town in southeast Tennessee. And uh, the year I was nine, I asked for a baseball glove. I remember that because I was obsessed with baseball at the time. And we were kind of like a lower part of the middle class family, pretty poor. And we didn't, I never had my own baseball glove despite being obsessed with baseball. And so I remember seeing a box under the tree that year that was the perfect size to hold a baseball glove. I'm like, this is it. It was from my grandmother. I rip off the paper, open up the box. And it was a box of magic tricks, like a little magic kit. And I was destroyed, man. I was like, no, I wanted the baseball glove, right? And part of the reason I was so desperate to be good at baseball is because that was kind of the sport at the time in my little small town. And I sucked at everything else. Uh, I also sucked at baseball, but I was like, oh, maybe this can be my thing so I can finally find acceptance and make friends, right? So I get this box of magic tricks. I'm totally bored. I have nothing else to do. And so I sit in my room. I learn my very first trick. I'm like, this is stupid. No one's going to be fooled by this. <clears throat> I march into the living room. I'm like, mom and dad gather around. Here's what grandma got me for Christmas. I put this little red ball in a cup. I covered up with the lid. It disappears. I make it reappear. And their eyes light up in awe and wonder. They were like, whoa, that was amazing. And I was like, I'm sorry. <laughs> They're like, uh, and so that moment, now that I've studied the neuroscience of wonder, I understand a little bit more about what was happening because one of the coolest aspects of wonder is how it gives us permission to believe in things that are really difficult to believe in outside of that state of wonder. But all I knew in that moment is that someone else was in awe of something that I had done. And it's the first time I remember feeling that in my entire life. I'm sure it happened when I was a kid. They were like, like, yeah, you peed in a toilet instead of in your diaper, right? Like, sure. I'm sure there were things that they celebrated. Like, oh, he's walking. He just yeah, took a few yeah. steps. But in terms of the childhood that I can remember, it was the first time that I remember someone being in awe of something that I had done. And that flipped my wonder switch back on. The switch that the bullies on the playground at my school had turned off. And, uh, man, I, I stepped into a whole new story that was filled with nothing but possibility. I love that because it's like there's no assumptions. There's no... No, and oh, when you when you have that mindset, and I can't help but use the word mindset a lot with you, Harris, because you talk about the wonder mindset in your book. Um, you mentioned the book mindset by Carol Dweck, which mm -hmm. I actually hadn't read before. You know, <laughs> the wonder switch. I was like, "Ooh, I gotta, I gotta go back to the original." Yeah. What What does it like? turning on the wonder switch like that's that's still a little fuzzy for somebody who's like sure. i don't understand that terminology or I, I don't know if that's even happened for me yeah How I, I, like, that down? I like the metaphor of a switch because i like and wonder to a light switch on the wall you know it's a switch that we all come into the world with our eyes wide open um the majority of us see possibility and we don't need to see proof of things in order to believe. As children, we tend to believe in things first before we see them with our own eyes. And that's why we are able to live in these worlds of not just make believe, but we believe and then we make. And then somewhere along the way, trauma starts to find its way into our stories. Our narratives get broken. We start to feel all these unfamiliar feelings that we're not equipped to deal with as children, like mm. shame. And then it often turns into addiction because we medicate for these gross feelings that we don't want to feel. Mm -hmm. And as a result, the switch gets flipped off. And that's almost like being in a world where the lights got turned off. And now it's really hard to see anything. <clears throat> One of the most powerful things about wonder is um, it gives us permission to believe before we see. And if, and I were to if I were to yeah. summarize that, I think it's because most human beings live as if seeing is believing. 
Um, and I think being in a state of wonder helps you move back to a place where believing is actually seeing. And when I say that, a lot of people think it's some sort of like new age woo woo concept where if I just close my eyes, I can like wish for something and then I just manifest it because I mm -hmm. believe it hard enough. Look, if I put, I want a private jet on my bathroom mirror and stare at it every single morning, right. it's never going to just appear in my life. Right. Right. Um, so just affirming something that I don't believe is possible is not going to work. You know, Dweck's book on mindset to me is like core curriculum for life. Um, and when you combine that mindset through the lens of wonder, this idea that we're in a state where we're able to believe before we can see, we begin to understand that you really can't eventually see anything unless you believe in it first, which is why we all have examples of people that we know where <clears throat> they can't see something. Sometimes it's glasses or mm -hmm. keys, something physical, but oftentimes it's a truth that's right in front of their face. And everyone around them can see the truth, but they can't seem to see the truth. All they, all they do is tell themselves a lie. The reason why is because they don't believe um, in that truth. And the moment you do, you're able to see it. And then you can begin the process of manifesting it. Uh, like I said, brief, brief is a challenge for me. Just no, it's wonderful. Stuff for me, but yeah, it really comes down to understanding that believing is seeing when you're in a state of wonder, it's easier to believe. And you're also mentioning perspective. We have a limited perspective. We, um, we might believe a story, you know, from the past, especially with trauma, guilt, mm -hmm. shame, yep. all those things that kind of get wadded up and stay inside of us. When someone comes out and says, Hey, you're a great magician. Hey, you're a good writer. Hey, you ask really good questions. Have you thought of being a coach or whatever? Hey, you're really good at, you know, drawing. It doesn't matter. I think that almost gives this unseen validation that we didn't even know we 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 knew we knew at some level we wanted it, but we, you know, it's it's so close to you. And I remember even my own story. It's like, well, duh, I wanted to be a writer. I mean, I wanted to work for the FBI until I saw that it's all, you know, bureaucracies and government. And I had my stint in bureaucracies and government. Didn't like that. But writing crime novels, ooh, this makes more sense. But it's almost like we can't connect those dots when they're right in front of us. We can kind of look back at our story and say, oh, okay. But I feel like in some ways that outside perspective is almost the pencil or the pen that helps us connect yeah. the dots a little. Yeah, that's that's what neuroscientists are finally studying. There's some amazing... Um, researchers at UC Berkeley that have been studying what they refer to as positive awe states. And they're amazing. When we're in a positive awe state, and I just say positive because awe is the root of the word awesome and awful, right? So we can certainly have a negative experience that leaves us in awe of how horrific it was. But we're in a positive awe state where we're going like, wow, that's amazing. I can't believe that. Like watching an amazing magic show or a beautiful sun rise or sunset or having this mountaintop experience or finding the magic in the seemingly mundane which is where wonder is more often found for the majority of us. If, if, but it just takes the right mindset and practice, right? When, when, we, when we're in that moment, in that positive awe state, there's all sorts of amazing research. Chronic inflammation in our body starts to decrease because our body starts producing more cytokines. Our immune system can go up. Stress can go down. We're more easily capable of empathizing with other people and connecting with them on an emotional level. All this amazing stuff. But perhaps my favorite part of research is that we are storytelling beings who walk around all day long telling ourselves stories to make sense of the world. And all the stories that we have been told and all the stories that we have experienced, whether we've interpreted them accurately or not, void of all lies is a completely different conversation, right? But we form this narrative and that narrative drives our thinking, the choices we make and our behavior consciously and subconsciously on a daily basis. And what, when these positive awe states, when we're in one, my favorite part of the research is that our brain begins to loosen its vice-like grip on the pre-existing narrative and it opens us up to the possibility of a new story that we're being invited into so to go back to your practical example of someone coming along going hey jim you're you're a really great writer if that's not something you previously believed if that conflicted with your narrative because you were questioning that as true if enough people say that to you it invites you into this positive awe state and you're going wow i can't believe those people think i'm actually good at this and that opens you up and it starts to force you to question the narrative that you had already adopted is true and wonder if the story they're telling you might be better and more true than the one you're already telling yourself. That's when we start to see behavior start to shift. That's when you are invited in. That's the little spark 
that I mentioned on the transformation map mm -hmm. in the book, the spark mm -hmm. that opens you up and you can begin the process of restoring your narrative, replacing the lie that you're not a good writer with the truth that you are, eventually restore your narrative. The wonder switch gets flipped back on and then you can start to be driven uh, in your life and in your work by the power of that wonder, wonder mindset. What if you don't have those big moments where you would say the wonder switch is flipped on? Uh, you're just in a negative space. You know that much. You know, you're like, oh, not liking where I am right now. What do you, th what would you recommend? Because, you know, even, I mean, you and I both, Harris, we're pretty transparent. We're honest guys. And mm -hmm. it's like, shoot, even you and I can have those days during the course of the week where it's like, I got, a bunch of tasks i'm not really feeling i i'm not so sure about this wonder switch <laughs> <laughs> yeah well a couple of things i would say on that um the the first of which is we all have those things the magic is all around us and so for someone who's like no harris the magic has left my life and there's no wonder to be found because i'm in a state where everything's falling apart and i'm right. fighting depression and right. et cetera et cetera et cetera right mm -hmm. the magic is always there one of my favorite quotes is from roald dahl famous author who said those who don't believe in magic will never find it and that just sort of reinforces the idea that i was talking about earlier that seeing may not always be believing but believing is actually seeing because what we believe has the power to change what we see but we as human beings don't need more than a couple of magic tricks to prove to us that what you see is not always what we get. We are not that great at determining what the truth is based on what our senses perceive because we are so easily fooled. Not because we aren't smart or intelligent. It's just because most of us don't exercise um, those deep intentional powers that we have built in to really siphon, decipher like what the truth really is and wade through the lies and deception. We are pretty easily deceived because we like to let other people do our thinking for us. It's a lot less effort and work. Really? Right? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. So absolutely. if Roald Dahl is right, if seeing is a believing, but those who don't believe in magic will never see it, then the people who are able to see the magic are the ones who choose to believe. You might think, well, how do I choose to believe? The same way you chose to believe everything else. The, the story that you currently believe is a story that you chose to believe. Now, you might have gone through an experience that made it easier to believe or something influential in the world around you might have made it very convincing and therefore you believed it. Mm -hmm. But your belief is a choice. And a lot of us don't realize that we have that much agency over the stories that we embrace and believe in. And so it starts by just taking a step back and recognizing, OK, I'm putting a little bit too much trust into what I see and what I feel and what I'm thinking and what I'm seeing and hearing and feeling may not always be accurate to what is actually true and real and good for me. And therefore, I have the agency and permission to question those things to determine if they're actually true. Uh, I think that's the first part. The second part is a long conversation about the work of subtraction instead of the work of addition, which is connected mm. to healing from trauma. So we can go there if you want to. But I think Roald Dahl is right. We must believe in the magic and then you'll be able to see it. It's right in front of your face. You just can't see it because you don't already believe. Yeah. Yeah. I I love the analogy of forest and the trees. Like you can't see the forest when you're just right up there, like nose against a tree. You're not going to see it. You have no perspective. And I I find that, again, it's like that connect in, connection of like, okay, back away a little get you know this like this one moment this one occasion this one story is just part of the big picture yeah. as you zoom out yeah. and uh i just i mean it's so easy to be busy and get lost in your to-do list get lost in your calendar right and then where's the magic where is the wonder when you're you know spending i mean it's almost like scheduling a little time to do nothing, to just be curious and, you know, find wonder is something like stepping away, not just, you know, face buried in a computer or a phone. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's what I mean by the mundane. It's hard to find uh, the magic if we don't zoom out a little bit because we get stuck in the mundane of just going from task to task to task. And the magic is there. We just can't see it until we take a step back and, and look through the cracks and the crevices and we look up and we look down. But we sort of live with this tunnel vision where we just keep running in the same direction as quickly yeah. as possible. Yeah.
what would you say when someone's like, okay, I, I realize this, I need to feed myself, you know, positivity, find places where I can explore yeah. and go on adventures. Even that can feel a little bit like a high bar when you're like, okay, I, I, I'm busy, you know, I'm doing yeah. all these things. I, I have a list. I'm telling you, I shouldn't be taking time off. I should be doing all these. <laughs> well, this oh. is, uh, I mean, what you're touching on is actually what I mentioned earlier. I feel like that's why that conversation is two parts, you know, mm. um, to, I would say like going out and searching for magic and learning how to find the magic that's right in front of your face by examining your belief systems. That is part of the work of finding your way back to wonder, because those are the sparks that give you permission to do the deeper work. But there's also some work of subtraction to be done because remember, wonder is our natural state. I think we mm. forget that. And so to, to find your way to wonder, an accurate way of talking about it is, is to say that we need to find our way back to wonder. Because again, the majority of the people, and of course there are exceptions to this, but the majority of us came into this world with the wonder switch on. We saw the magic because we believed in it. It wasn't a problem. Santa Claus was real until we realized something different, right? right. Um, and so it's like we didn't, we didn't need all this physical proof, which means there is something along the way that turned the wonder switch off. And now you are no longer in your natural, healthy childhood state. And so how do we get back to that childlike state? That's the work of subtraction I was talking about. It's about going back and getting rid of all of the things that are clogging uh, the pathway, right? It's the work of the undoing of everything that isn't really us to begin with that Paul Paulo Coelho talks about. Um, you know, this is the healing from trauma. It's the pushing back against the shame. It's the checking in somewhere to fight off some of the addiction. It's to go talk to someone about the depression that we find ourselves in. It's doing the difficult inner work mentally and emotionally to get rid of the stuff that is sort of clamping its way down. It's the straight jacket on the narrative that won't, no matter how hard we believe, won't give us permission to ever see because the choosing to believe will only get us so far. It's, it's the equivalent of, if you go back to that post-it note on the bathroom mirror with the private mm -hmm. jet that I talked about, yeah, you know, if you, if you're struggling to believe that you're enough or that you belong or that something that you've been craving and desiring your entire life is out of reach for you because you're not worthy of it. If I put a, a post-it note of something that's true, like you are enough on my bathroom mirror and look at it every single morning, a lot of people like they call those affirmations, right? The science does not support that that affirmation will ever work, nor does the average experience of the average human being show that it works. Mm -hmm. I can tell myself I'm enough. You're enough. You're enough. You're enough over and over and over again. But unless I unpack the lie mm -hmm. that I'm not enough and where that is coming from and reframe that story, me just telling myself something that's true or someone else telling me the truth is right. not going to replace that lie with the truth. Right. I still am holding to the existing narrative that I'm not. It is like trying to build or repair or renovate a house on a cracked foundation. Ooh, yeah. Cracking the foundation is the trauma. And until you diff do the difficult work of healing from that trauma and reframing that story mm -hmm. and, and a redemptive perspective on that suffering, um, as Man's Search for Meaning, another great book talks about, Victor Frankl, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. it's going to be really hard to just go, oh, I'll just believe that that's true now. You mentioned redemption stories, and I, I think I mentioned this once in a, a meeting you were having, um, or maybe it was the, uh, it was an event you were having, and I said, well, what if all stories are redemption stories? And I have to ask you, like, what are some of your favorite, you know, stories in general? And I bet we could fit them into redemption somehow. <laughs> um, gosh, you know, it's. It's endless. Um, any any relationship that has been repaired to me is an mm. amazing redemptive story because at the heart of all of us is that we're craving love and belonging. And so when love and belonging gets severed and then redeemed, mm. to me, that speaks to the deepest crevices of our soul. Um, and I think that also aligns, you know, with a lot of religious faiths um, yeah. that have Absolutely. survived hundreds, thousands of years. Um, as a person of faith, obviously, I look at the biblical narrative and part of what draws me to that is that it's a story of redemption, that, man, the world is completely messed up and broken, but that things are being redeemed. And that is very hopeful to me. And any 
religious narrative that is absent of that redemption part of the narrative, it's pretty hopeless and unappealing to me, right? And so there's entire exactly. conversations that could be had around that. And I think when we when we take on the responsibility of playing a redemptive role in the world around us, um, that's a very aspirational way to live, to wake up in the morning with a sense of meaning and purpose because you are trying to redeem the broken state of the world, which takes me back to one of my favorite quotes from a well-known storyteller. He never really exactly said these words, apparently, but the screenwriter from Saving Mr. Banks really tried to get into the mind of, through the archives of what Walt Disney believed that storytellers did in the world and mm -hmm. summarized it with this beautiful quote in the film. There's a scene where Disney, Tom Hanks in that case, leans in and says, that's what we storytellers do. We restore order with imagination. And mm. it's all hope again and again and again. And I love that idea. If we're all storytellers, because that's what human beings are, whether we accept that role or put it on our business card or not, we are storytelling beings because it's how we make sense of the world and narrative is the operating system of our brains. And so if we sort of take up arms of, in our role as storytellers, what storytellers do is we restore order. We look at the world where things are broken or in chaos and we restore order by stirring imagination and that gives people hope. So I think in in for in many senses, we're all in the middle of a constant redemption story. And you can zoom in and see all these little redemption stories, and you can zoom out and see this, you know, massive story arc where we're all a part of the same redemptive narrative. Does that make sense at all? Yeah, it does. And I think you're right. You're like, where do I not love <laughs> all stories? <laughs> and having that lens is is really important to say, oh look closer. There's a glimmer of hope right there. And that one little part that is easy to overlook and it could easily be viewed as a redemption story. And I think that's, that's just such a unique perspective. I think we can all do it. Absolutely. If we want to, yeah. the question is, you know, are we willing to? Yeah. Yeah. I think now I'm, I'm having flashbacks to the event you were talking about in the story town hall. And <laughs> I think it came up in, in response to justice stories, right? The world is mm. very obsessed with justice right now. Um, and oftentimes within good reason, right? There's been a lack of a lot of social justice and we're getting around to fixing some of those problems and narratives. I just think that getting and receiving justice without redemption is going to leave us feeling still hungry and thirsty for more. It's like, okay, cool. Justice was served, but yet, a hollow. And, yeah, the crevices yeah. of our hearts still create yeah. redemption. And so I think when when we achieve justice and then redemption is achieved on the heels of justice being served, oh my goodness, that's a powerful combination. That's when magic starts happening and we start seeing narratives get shifted uh, in a really big way and change starts happening in our cultures. Absolutely. We mentioned uh, Carol Dweck's mindset book. Mm -hmm. I have to hold up your book as well because your book is amazing. We'll promote it more in a second here. The but Wonder Switch by shoulder. Harris is a fantastic shoulder. read. And yeah. I can't recommend it enough. What other books have been really instrumental for you where you're like, wow, this, I keep referring to this over and over again. Yeah. Well, thank you for the kind words about the Wonder Switch. Yeah, I was just saying it stands on the shoulders of a lot of research um, for a lot of people and other books that have gone before it. Um, you know, like start with the section around the Wonder Mindset. If that's what you feel like you need to need to get to before reading uh, Carol's book. But yeah. if you read the wonder mindset and you're like, how do I take this deeper? It is absolutely on the heels of everything that she has helped us understand and um, embrace uh, as reality around how mindsets drive our thinking and behavior. Another word for mindset that I think is interchangeable is just narrative. And so I would encourage mm. anyone to just explore any book on the subject of understanding how we think as storytellers. Uh, the Storytelling Animal, I think, is a yeah. really great book. <laughs> yeah, uh, let's think of that one. Is it Jonathan Got Gottschall or something like yeah, that? Yeah, Jonathan Gottschall. Um, yeah, yeah. I don't align with his worldview in the book, um, but so much of the thinking um, around exploring how we are story beings mm -hmm. um, through the Storytelling Animal book was was very intriguing and formed. A, it was a, just a really great, strong contribution to help me helping me solidify some of my thoughts that were flowing through my head around how we're your story creatures. Um, so I think that's great. Um, you can obviously go take that deeper by reading a multitude of story books. They can turn to people like you, Jim, who's constantly offering them story resources. Uh, they can come to story conference, the annual gathering that we produce yeah. for storytellers. 
Um, in terms of books, I read a lot of Seth Godin. I know a lot of people think of him as a marketing or a business author. Uh -huh. I think of him as a futurist. I don't know that he's ever recalled himself that. Um, but I think he's, I think we need voices in our world who help us look into the future, mm -hmm. make sense of a future narrative that we haven't experienced yet, put it into language that we can understand and invite us into it, which I think is what leaders do. Great leaders go, hey, I can see the future. There's a new story. And I want to invite you to come be a part of this story. And they grab people by the hand and uh, run into the future together. Um, so, yeah, I tend to read stuff that's on uh, how do we understand and think about the future, anything related to leadership. Uh, anything by Seth Godin and anything related back to mindset or story. Nice. Have you read Poke the Box by Seth Godin? Yes. That one was instrumental for me because it's it's so short and little, but it yeah. really is just a box about questioning things and changing yeah. things and yeah. trying things out. And I, I read that right when I was at a crossroads. It was my inciting incident, if you will, of like, Hey, I don't want to be an accountant anymore. Um, what should I go do? And I was, it was like the perfect timing that it was that combined with like Stephen Pressfield's Do the Work. And I had both those books and I have, you know, multiple copies. I don't even know where they all are. I gave away copies yeah. and I carried them around with me and all that. Um, you know what you said when you said poke the box, that reminded me of um, there's a phrase in an amazing book that was very instrumental in, in shaping my thoughts and that was it's called leadership and self-deception hmm. um it doesn't i don't think the book if i remember correctly names a specific author it's some type of institute uh that is sort of like the author of the book uh or at least on the cover um but in the in the book there's this constant language about getting out of the box um and it, it goes back to a lot of what you and i have been discussing which is we sort of limit our perspective and what great leaders do is they get out of that box that allows them to see past their blind spots um, and the ways that we deceive ourselves, the stories that we make up that aren't true to make sense of our pain and experiences in the world, um, which just takes us back to those lies I was talking about earlier. I think there's only three lies. Every other lie fits into those three boxes. I'm not enough. I don't belong. And I can't. I can't fill in the blank. I can't attain this thing. I can't achieve this thing. Uh, almost every other lie that we tell ourselves just falls piles into, on those. Yeah. Yeah. It falls yep. into those three buckets. Um, and a lie is just an untrue story. And the birth of that untrue story came out of us making sense of some sort of experience in the world. So if you're a little kid and maybe the truth is um, the truth that gets questioned, like adults are nice and kind and safe, but then all of a sudden an, an adult hurts or harms you. Sure. That conflicts with your narrative at six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 15 years old, even. Right. And mm -hmm. so you're like, okay, but adults are supposed to be safe. But if that adult wasn't safe, we make sense of it. Uh, and the narrative gets broken because the story we make up is, well, there must be something wrong with me. I must be broken. Right. 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 All of a sudden it's like, oh, I'm not enough. I didn't measure up. And that's why my teacher yelled at me. Right. right. Um, and so that book was really great, especially for leaders, leadership and self-deception. I think, too, uh, a friend of mine literally printed out this piece of paper. It was like a picture from Seinfeld. It was a picture of Costanza. And he just he puts funny things on my on my workspace. Just just a funny guy. And he's like, it, it was Costanza. And it said, it's not a lie if you believe it. Mm -hmm. And in context with this conversation, I'm like, yeah, if you're accepting it 100 percent as truth it becomes part of your value system. It becomes hardwired. And yeah, no wonder, like you said, you have to really do that hard work of going back and, you know, uh, yeah. addition and subtraction. Yes. If you really believe that lie is completely true, it's, it's going to be hard to release, to move past that because yeah. it's, it's so part of you. Yeah. It's a lens, right? It's like a, yeah. a pair of glasses that you put on and see the world. Yep. Um, which is why I say that seeing is not believing. It's why you can have two people who believe two different things, but interpret the exact same experience in two different ways. They are seeing the exact same thing with their own eyes, but what they are seeing is being informed by what they believe. And therefore they interpret it differently, which is why all change, all transformation comes at the level of belief systems of mindset. That's why we constantly come back to those words. 
Um, which also brings me back to, I think, Victor Frankl and Man's Search for Meaning, another great book that really helps us understand that, you know, uh, I think Freud was wrong, uh, that uh, basically we're all in pursuit of pleasure, um, that that's what drives, you know, our motivation behind everything. Yeah. Uh, and we are only in pursuit of pleasure when our life is absent of meaning. And so I think Victor, Victor mm -hmm. Frankl took it a step further, wrote an amazing book called Man's Search for Meaning. And really gives us insight into what makes us tick as human beings. Um, and when your life is void of meaning and you don't have that redemptive perspective on your suffering, it's really hard to push forward and carry on. On that topic there, on that very note, one of the best, I don't want to say solutions, but one of the best tools is community. And mm -hmm. you've created some amazing communities, Harris, the story community, you had the circle, you have the inner circle, all communities that support each other, hold each other accountable, lift each other up. Has community been that uh, thing for you as well? I mean, you you formed them. You obviously believe in them. But you wouldn't oh, be forming sure. them. Yeah, yeah. And like, uh, that's my motivation, right? Behind, I tend to form communities that solve for the isolation that I sense and feel in the world. Um, you know, I started doing story conference because... I found it as a place of belonging for myself as a storyteller. I felt pretty lonely and isolated and um, felt like I wanted to do things that were bigger and went beyond just performing a magic show mm. and like no offense against the magic industry in general. Yeah. But when you go to a magic conference, it's like, here's six more secret moves and three more gimmicks and a hundred right. new card tricks you can perform. There wasn't a compelling story that people were interested in uniting together to tell. And so in the absence of that compelling story, I went searching for it somewhere else. Mm. I thought, well, gosh, like, and then I stepped into understanding the power that storytellers have and thought, well, if storytellers are this powerful, someone ought to be gathering them together to have a conversation about that collective power. Um, and so, yeah, that's, that was me solving for something that I was feeling. Same thing with solo. Um, you know, we started doing this conference called SoloCon for solopreneurs mm -hmm. because I got frustrated that. I sat between freelancing and entrepreneurship. Everyone's like, you're a freelancer because you're not an entrepreneur. I'm like, that's weird because these people are calling me an entrepreneur. But if I go look for resources for freelancers, it falls short because I'm trying to build something that's bigger than just me. I'm not interested in just freelancing and exchanging time for money. But yet if I go hang out with entrepreneurs, they're all raising capital and developing exit strategies. And I'm like, I don't have an exit strategy. I love the work I'm doing. And I started doing it to solve for like, the lack of meaning and purpose I felt in my life. So why would I want to get rid of it and sell it off to someone else? It just doesn't work. Right. So I realized, gosh, there's a bunch of other people out there like me and they're all working in isolation. And so I started this thing called solo con, which quite literally the root of the word solo only con, which literally means with. And so only with others can we succeed out of that came the circle, the inner circle. Um, and it's really just me responding to a need that I see in the world. Uh, where it's far too many people are working in isolation and realize that we can be far better together. And so oh, yeah. we'll gather together through some form of live experience whenever possible, but let's keep in touch throughout the year online and really build a meaningful community. And that's even what I was, what I've been doing with this show. I told you, I was like reaching out, having intentional conversations versus not, you know, we can't be reactive. If we're reactive, things often don't happen. Um, but being proactive and you know putting those intentional <laughs> times on the calendar versus you know winging it, and then you don't talk to people for a year, two years, three years, you know. And um, it, I think that's unacceptable for me. I, it's like no, we need to, we need, to, we need to you know, maintain relationships and we are so much better together. Even if you have the most isolating, you know, creative endeavor, you still need others around you. Yeah. Yeah. No doubt. No doubt. It's been, it's been amazing. And to see someone who has spent years struggling to get something done because the lack of getting something done is connected to choices and behavior. Uh, and the choices in behavior can't be changed without changing the narrative. But then they get they leave isolation, they get plugged into community, and all of a sudden the new narrative gets reinforced. The new behavior and thinking and choices start getting practiced and put into place, um, and change really starts to occur. 
at the end of the day, that's what I'm obsessed with, right? It goes back to that redemption story that we were talking about. If we're going to redeem things that are broken, we must shift narratives. And if we're going to shift the narrative and change and transform the world around us, we've got to use effective practices and principles. And the most effective way that human beings are learning right now is not just access to the right content, right? Mm. 90 something percent of the people don't buy the books they read. It's even less uh, in online courses. And so now that online education is booming, it's like, oh, I just need to go enroll in another course. (laughs) Yet less than 5% of the people that are enrolling a course ever complete it. What's missing? Clearly the world is not starving for more content. I think what we need is the right content in the, co- in the context of the right cohort or community and the content in a community aspect. When we learn together, when we grow together, when the truth is reinforced by way of being connected to other human beings. And then when you throw in the power of the right mentors and guides and coaches, man, content, coaching and community, that is a very powerful triangle where magic starts to happen. I like that. It makes me think of the focus triangle where it's so much more powerful um, when you're building habits, you know, same place, same time, same tool. Mm-hmm. That's what you're doing with that right there. Yeah. Same community <laughs> coaching and content. Yeah, that's that's incredible. I love it. So you mentioned the now there's the solo conference is coming up in April, mm-hmm. right? Mm hmm. And is, is there a, uh, any sign up yet on that, or you're going to send out an email later on that? Yeah. You can go to solocon.com, just S O L O C O N.com. Um, awesome. registration for that is opening very soon and it's completely Great. free again this year. We're doing Amazing. another one day virtual summit. So completely Amazing. free online virtual conference experience. And, um, pe- I think sometimes people hear the word virtual summit and they're just like, Oh, that's not another one of those. For those who know us well, like what our team produces, like this is not just another virtual conference. This is not a Zoom meeting. Um, This is not like a live stream with a live chat. Um, We we do it right with an incredible uh, like built out platform. It's very interactive. There's lots of breakouts with cameras on. Yeah, Um, it's it's really well done. So you will grow. I can't believe we're doing it for free again. It's going to be pretty awesome. Last year, it honestly changed everything for me. I I met my editor (laughs) at that event. And yeah, it was fantastic. I I have no doubt at all. It'll be amazing. And you have the story conference, which is going to be in person. And uh, online. And online. And that's next September, I believe, right? Yeah, it's in September. Uh, Storygatherings.com. Uh, is the story's website, or you can just go straight to the conference uh, page by going to story2022.com, story2022.com, and that will take you straight to the conference website. Registration is already open for that. Um, you can get an online ticket and attend virtually, or you can join us in person in Nashville. Um, I think because of the world being in chaos the last couple of years, there are some people each year who have chosen to just, you know what, just push my ticket to next year when we're able right. to person and that has happened so often and our capacity is still limited uh, because of the unknowns and so right now uh, we might open up more capacity but right now i think there's less than like 150 tickets left oh wow uh, for in person before we sold out yeah so i would check that out story 2022.com fantastic and uh we got to mention the the book again wonder switch (laughs) this book i i absolutely love it and it's it's a pleasure to revisit it um, I remember when you were, when you were working on this almost two years ago, we're creeping up on the anniversary and so much has changed mm-hmm. over the last two years. Yeah. Um, but a lot has stayed the same and everything in this book still applies. It's evergreen and super encouraging. And, uh, I can't recommend it highly enough. I I've seen what, what great things you've done with it already, Harris. And I, I kind of, in the background, I'm kind of biting my knuckles going, okay, when's he going to do another? Cause, <laughs> because there it's, is already so being, much it's already being worked on. Yeah. Me? Yeah. That's right. That's really, like, yeah, I'm, I'm working on it right now. <laughs> that's fantastic. Yeah. Thank you so much, Harris, for your time. And thank you for being with me. I'll include the links uh, for the, with the video for that you mentioned for solo con and then for the story 22, 2022, Mm-hmm. as well as a link, link to the wonder switch uh, so people can pick up a copy too. So Yeah, man. Well, I appreciate your kind words. You are familiar with the book because of your contribution. I don't think I could have gotten it done without you. Oh, thank you so uh, much. So those, those final, those final few weeks of like, 
I need some editing help and I need to organize this section. It's not making sense. Help, help, help. It was a labor of love between <laughs> both of us. And it was, it was, it, it's, I remember it so much because it was like one of those memorable moments, you know, it's like, I love working with first time authors. I do. It's like, this is, this is unique versus once you've written a few books, I'm not saying it's not, it's always special, but the very first time it's even more special. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm super excited about the second one. So maybe we'll have to talk again soon. Fantastic. Fantastic. Thanks again, Harris. Everyone, I do recommend going to the links below and uh, checking out Harris. Thank you so much. Yeah, I appreciate your time.